Hello, this is John Wobenhorst, and welcome to this presentation about Indian music for the Western flutist. And uh, really it's about Indian music for any instrument, because you can play this music on any instrument. Yes, there is the authentic, you want to say authentic instruments in quotes, uh, that it's, I would say, are better, can better enable this music. But on the other hand, you can play it on any, on any instrument really, because we're talking about melodic structures and melodic content. And certainly you can learn on any instrument. You may not be an aspiring concert person, but just want to learn some more about this wonderful music. In any rate, I thought I'd just give you some of my background, how I got into music and what Indian music has meant to me in my life. I started out actually as a singer in rock and roll bands, and I was, got into a lot of blues. I used to carry around 10 of these blues harmonicas around. And then I was doing, uh, I was singing in rock bands, I was playing the blues, and then that's about the time when, you know, Jethro Tull was out there. So I started playing flute because I could do it while I was standing and singing. He had a version he did of that uh, box beret. <laughs> So anyway, I got into the Jethro Tull and doing rock, but very soon into that, I got into a lot of jazz, um, you know, different standard, standard jazz pieces, you know, some bebop, Charlie Parker. And, uh, you know, John Coltrane. Etc. Etc. But um, somewhere along this time, I also got into classical Western music, and many of you know this classical Western literature. I wasn't focused just on it uh, exclusively, but I love playing all the Bach flute sonatas. And of course, the Bach and different Romantic composers, Debussy. And sometime along this place, I, around this time, I also got into classical Indian music. I think my high school library had one Indian music record. It was Ravi Shankar live at the Monterey Pop Festival. And I can still remember that record because I listened to it every day. So I, I got to uh, listen to Ravi Shankar say, Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Gives me such a great honor to play most beautiful raga of the late afternoon. So he went on to play this beautiful rendition of a, a raga known as rag Bimpalasi. And it was just, it just hit me on a very deep level, this music. And also at the same time, I was listening to a lot of jazz where a lot of the jazz musicians had been deeply influenced by Indian music. Of course, the Beatles. We all know the Beatles. And uh, I think Norwegian Wood was perhaps the first time there was an Indian instrument on a Beatles record. That's my understanding. Down, 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 down. Just that very simple part. But obviously, it got a little more elaborate as time went on. So by the time he did Within Without You on Sgt. Pepper's, it was, it was much more intricate, much more advanced. There were different time cycles going on, starting out in a 16-beat cycle, going to a 10-beat cycle, etc., etc. So it was much more elaborate at that point. But by that point, of course, John Coltrane had been listening to Indian music, people like John McLaughlin, uh, the group Oregon. So I was really drawn to Indian music for so many reasons. In fact, I'd been very drawn to the type of modal jazz that you hear from Miles Davis, John Coltrane. And so I like the idea of staying on one mode sometimes. Of course, I like playing on the jazz changes as well, but sometimes it's really nice just to stay on one mode. Uh, you think of pieces like Miles Davis in a silent way. And then groups like Weather Report were starting to play some stuff that was very modal sometimes. And really, to me, Indian music and these ragas is really a very elaborate, you could say, a very elaborately um, sophisticated modal music. Because in Indian music, there are no chord changes. There is no harmony. So the, the melodic structure becomes very important. 
And that brings us to, of course, the age-old question, what is a raga? And Ravi Shankar says, a raga is that which colors the mind. So what does that mean? Well, it means the raga is actually a color of consciousness. I think you can make an analogy. What is the blues? The blues is not the blues scale. The blues scale helps us to play the blues. But really the blues is, you could say, an abstract feeling. And of course, there's many variations of the blues, Chicago blues, this blues, that blues. So there's many different types of variations, but there is this fundamental feeling of the blues. So it's like that with each raga. Each raga has what they call a rasa or a mood. But then, corresponding to that mood, there are lots of technicalities. There's a certain way you go up the scale, ascending scale. There's a certain way you go down the scale. Then there's certain key phrases to a particular raga. In fact, when I was taking exams, uh, I studied North Indian music at the Rotterdam Conservatorium. I, uh, they would used to play, we, we, we would have exams, and they would just play one phrase. What raga is that? And if you knew the ragas well enough, you knew that that certain key phrase is a key signal to the rag shud sarang. So that's just one example. But the main point is, is that uh, I became very interested in this music, and of course, I won't say it's impossible to learn Indian music on your own, but everybody I knew <laughs> who'd gotten really good had some rigorous training with a guru in most cases. There's a, gurus, a guru tradition in India that's uh, a little bit stronger than I would say in the West. Obviously, there's been very great teachers in Western music as well, but this idea of the guru is very strong in, in, in all of Indian culture. And anyway, there was these elaborate, incredible musicians. And I was very fortunate to meet many of them. First, I learned uh, in, the, in, in the US, I met a man made, named Debu Prasad Banerjee, who was a wonderful Bansuri player. I, I learned from a student of Ali Akbar Khan. This, fellow, this uh, gentleman was not actually a Bansuri player. He could do the basic fingerings, but he had learned the raga structures from the great maestro Ali Akbar Khan. And then I met a man named Vijay Raghav Rao, who had worked extensively with Ravi Shankar. And finally, this love of this music was so overpowering, I took everything I owned. Somehow I found this storage unit uh, where I was living in Virginia for $17 a month. They let me put everything I owned into a corner of this barn. And I went to India. And I said, I just love this music. I'm going to go swim in this music. And it was on that trip that I met Hari Prasad Chaurasia. And of course, by that time, I was already you know, playing. Uh, not just Western flute, but I learned how to play, I was learning how to play this Bansuri. So of course this is the Bansuri, if you haven't seen it before, probably you have. But anyway, uh, the Bansuri is uh, basically a piece of bamboo. However, because of its open hold techniques, you can get a lot more of the expressions of Indian music. Let me put the drone on here for just a little bit here. Had a very beautiful sound, but also because of the open hole structures, you could, um, let me just get that off here. Because of these open holes, you can do a lot more of what they call meaned. Meaned is this gliding. Ah, or the gummocks, which are the more like we would call in Western music grace notes. <laughs> So there's a whole range of ornamentation in Indian music, just like there is in Baroque music. All different types of music have their own types of ornamentation. And in Indian music, those are most easily done on Indian instruments. However, it's not that you can't get some effect with the Western flute. Now I'm going to play some.
So that's an example of playing the same rock I was just playing on the Von Suri on the Western flute. So you can't get the full effect, but at the same time, it's beautiful music. So, I was very fortunate to meet Hari Prasad Charasya and just the incredible musicality of his tone, the incredible uh, technique he had developed, the incredible just utter beauty of the music coming out of this flute that he was playing was just... Uh... So I stayed with him for two years in India and then I was going back and forth a little bit but I was mainly in India for two years and then he invited me to come to the Rotterdam Conservatory in Holland where he was teaching. And um, so for the next 12 years I went to the Rotterdam Conservatory. Again I wasn't living there full time. I was in the, living in Washington DC but I'd take these trips two, three week trips, come back, two or three week trips, come back. So I was a commuting from Washington DC <laughs> to Rotterdam, Holland for 12 years and that time I got two degrees in world music from the Rotterdam Conservatory. But really it was just a matter of sitting mainly with Hari Prasad in this small room, these small rooms where he would teach his lessons and we would just, he would just play things and then I'd repeat. He'd play and repeat but we do this for three, four hours sometimes at a time. And I'd have my lesson, then someone else would have their lesson, but I'd sit in on that lesson. So oftentimes I'd be in this room with Hari Prasad for four, five, six hours at a time sometimes. So that was just incredible. Um, I feel like it's going to take me many lifetimes to fully absorb <laughs> all that I've gotten from this time with him. But um, I never stopped playing Western flute because I love the Western flute as well. There's certain advantages with Western flute. So to me, it's just different. There's certain things you can do on the western flute you cannot do on the bamboo flute and vice versa. And um, so, you know, in fact, I'm starting now to learn some of the, you know, some of the western classical pieces sound beautiful on the Bonsuri. <laughs> Nevertheless, I do go back and forth between these instruments and I also play keyboards. So perhaps I would have gotten farther if I just stuck to one, uh, one exact type of music, but I can't help myself. I love so many different types of music. I love, I still play the Bach flutes not as often. I play Hindemith and Debussy and all kinds of music on the Western flute. I play all kinds of music on the bamboo flute, but I do love playing these ragas. And I think there's a lot to learn from these ragas. Um, you know, growing up in the West, uh, it's, it's a different kind of music. At first when I heard this music, I couldn't understand how these guys could improvise for so long on just a few phrases. Because you'd hear these guys playing a raga, and you'd hear some themes come in and out, but they would go on and on and on. You know, half an hour, 45 minutes, two hours on just one piece. So to me, I just thought these guys are some kind of gods, which they are. <laughs> this is very godly music in one way. But on the other hand, it's a certain way of practicing. So it's a certain way of learning. In other words, I learned early on in jazz that if you want to play on giant steps and some of Coltrane's and some of these difficult pieces, you have to practice a certain way. You have to practice to learn how to play over these changes. So it's the same way with Indian music. You have to learn certain ways, you have to learn certain exercises, you have to learn certain compositions and different exercises within those compositions, etc., etc. So with any music it takes a certain approach. So I realize there are a lot of musicians out there who are learning uh, Western flute or it could be saxophone or any other instrument, but uh, they wanted to have more of a in-depth dive into this music of the ragas and, um, but maybe we're not going to learn a traditional Indian instrument. Now, of course, everyone can learn some singing. So, of course, in Western music you have Do, Re, Mi, Fa, Sol, La, Ti, Do. In Indian music, Sa, Re, Ga, Ma, Pa, Da, Ni, Sa, Sa, Ni, Da, Pa, Ma, Ga, Re, Sa. So I really encourage people to learn the sargam because it's a very flexible uh, way to learn the ragas. And if you can learn it with your voice at the same time, you're learning with your instrument. That's a deep way to imbibe uh, these ragas into. 
パーマガレサレサネサガマパーマガパーマガレサレサ。Etc. Etc. So, I realized that I started teaching a lot of people who were on Western instruments, but they wanted to learn more about these ragas and learn the beautiful flow of this music. So I finally decided I'm going to open up a membership site where people can come and、uh, listen to these. Different lessons over and over again, and get some direction, but really just play along with me online, and、uh, just come to really、uh, dive deeper into some of this music. Now, I will say that Indian music is a huge, vast field. It's like saying Western classical music, or saying the word jazz. There's huge amounts of idioms and genres and subgenres, and so I don't claim to be a master of any of them really. But there's many different places to explore. You have the Drupad tradition, which is maybe a precursor to the modern Indian music as we know it, where they're playing a little bit more slowly, not as much ornamentation, but that's also a beautiful way to learn.、Uh, then there's these many ragas, as I said.、Um, now, then there's North Indian and South Indian. There's two main systems of music. They call the North Indian Hindustani music or South music, South Indian music, Carnatic. Most of my training is in North Indian music. However, I've also learned South Indian music. I did study South Indian vocal music. Sa ma ja ba ra ga ma na. Sa du re. Sa ma ja ba ra ga ma na. Sa du re. So I don't claim to be a master of it at all, but I have delved into and taken South Indian, and I I plan on teaching a little bit of South Indian music for the Western flute, but mostly North Indian music. Just because that's where I have more、uh, of a background, and along the way in this membership site,、um, I'm going to also invite different guests in, different vocalists, different instrumentalists who just might have different angles on certain ragas, and certain angles on practicing, certain angles on the beauty of the ragas. I'm certainly going to go through the internet, gather great YouTube's, great recordings of these ragas, and put all this information together. So this is just going to be an ever-expanding <laughs> membership of Indian music concepts for the Western flutist or Western musician of any type. So I hope you just enjoy, and I hope this helps you dive into this wonderful, profound music, and you enjoy as much as I do. Now we'll also be talking about the rhythms because in Indian music there's two things: raga and tala. So the tala is the rhythmic structures. And these are also very intricately deep. There's many, many things to learn about Indian rhythms, and we'll we'll be talking about that too. This is not going to be a mainstream. You're not going to end up being a tabla maestro from learning these things. But you need to know some basic things. We'll experiment with different time cycles. There's a main cycle is teen tal of 16 beats, rupak tal of seven beats, jap tal ten beats, etc. So there's a few main tabla cycles. But there's many infant varieties too. My South Indian、uh, friends taught me a a piece,、uh, a a time signature of eight and a half beats. So there's all different types of things, and there is definitely an interaction between the raga and the rhythm. Although they're basically separate, a raga is the structure of the notes. The tala is the rhythmic cycle. So you could、uh, pretty much have a raga in all different time cycles. And in fact, you could have a time cycle without the raga. You could have a tabla solo. Without the raga, but、um, there is a lot to learn about how to maneuver within the time cycles, especially when you're improvising in Indian music. So these are just some of the things、uh, that I wanted to say here. Yeah, I think that's basically it for an introduction. So I'm glad that you're here, and I'm glad.、Uh, I hope I can just help you to enjoy this great music as much as I do.、Uh, if that happens, then.、Um, Mission is accomplished. <laughs> so、um, stay tuned here. There's going to be different lessons added on a regular basis, and、um, there'll be information.、Uh, if I need to put extra information, I'll put it on the screen here. I'll just flash some information on where you where you can go to check things out. And again,、uh, if you have any questions, you can always write me 
at uh, brightworldarts at gmail.com brightworldarts at gmail.com I'll put that on the screen here as well and uh, that's it for now and I'll be talking to you soon on one of these lessons